Thanks very much, Umron, as we have this opportunity to be here as a sponsor meeting. And uh, we are three people. We are going to present presentation on the issue. It's me, Kostas Priftis. I'm from Athens, Greece, from the National Kabbalistrian University of Athens. I'm going to present what is a wheezing and why it is important to confirm it is wheezing. Professor Bulen Karadas uh, from uh, the University of Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, he's going to present the struggle of pediatricians and parents with a wheezing child. And uh, the third, finally, Professor Wim van Alderen presenting on introducing uh, WizCan, a new tool to help parents confirm wheezing. I'm going to present uh, what is a whiz and why it is important to confirm it is a wheezing sound. Noisy breathing is very well-known clinical sign. All clinical clinicians uh, we are using it, especially pediatricians, doctors involved with children have uh, very uh, high in the way of uh, seeing people, examining people, getting history, learning very many details as they can about noisy breathing. It starts from the very early ages. Hippocrates used it. But centuries later, René Lenec, he used it. Uh, and uh, we can see this picture as he was using auscultation, having this ear on the chest of the ill people. That's why he invented uh, the stethoscope. It is now 200 years from that period. Stethoscope still is the tool doctors use to listen to the chest, to check breath sounds. Breath sounds could be also through the mouth and we could detect with naked ear. Breath sounds is, as I said, the main tool we get from the history as a symptom. So it is not easy and we pay very much attention on that information. Lenek, from the beginning, in 1819, that it is much more difficult to describe than to distinguish uh, breath sounds. It is uh, really, we all clinicians, we could confirm uh, how true was the notice Lenek wrote this time. So in my presentation, I'm going to say about breath sounds classification and then the clinical importance on the breath sounds detecting. Six years ago, it was published a very essential paper from New England Journal of Medicine uh, on the fundamentals of lung auscultation. It was written uh, by Bohadana Izbeki and Steve Kramen. So they had essentially divided as normal respiratory sounds and abnormal respiratory sounds, very reasonable. In normal, we have a trachea sound, lung or vesicular sounds, and bronchial breathing. As abnormal, we have uh, two groups, musical sounds and non-musical sounds, and a mixed, the one which is squawk. Stridor, whiz, and ronchus are musical. Fine crackle, coarse crackles, and plural friction rub are non-musical. Our whiz is in the group of musical respiratory sounds. Two years later, it was another paper that came up. It was by task force uh, of ERS as the report of this task force. First author was past Hans Pasterkamp, well, very well known. And uh, essentially, uh, we followed 
the line very close to Bohadana paper. Uh, we have normal or basic sounds and adventitious sounds. It is lung sounds when we detect them from the chest or respiratory sounds anywhere detected from uh, the mouth or the neck or from any way or through the naked ear. And we have rub, grunting, snoring, cough, all these snow, all these sounds. And again, we have uh, the classification as discontinuous and continuous. In other words, uh, non-musical and musical. Here we have the musical breath sounds, high-pitched and low-pitched. High-pitched as wheezes and low-pitched as bronchus, as ronchi. Whiz, as we said, it is a high-pitched heard with or without stethoscope, especially during expiration. It is produced by obstruction of airflow within intrathoracic airways. We can in this way detect asthma as an asthma sign or can be produced by bronchiolitis or by malaysia or by a foreign body. For so different entities producing in a different way but pathophysiologically uh, with the same way, with bronchus. Bronchus is another type of musical continuous breath sound. We have two types of bronchus, sowing produced by different pathology. We have low-pitched wheeze, which comes from airway wall flutter or snoring character uh, through secretions, as we can see here. Uh, the point is that bronchus, it is a sound uh, which is difficult to be recognized uh, if it is from airway wall flutter or through air through secretions, coming through secretions. So although there are two different pathologies, they produce the same sign. And what is the clinical importance uh, of detecting correctly the breath sounds, especially wheezing? Yes, it is. And we can see uh, through this paper, the adventure, I could say, of lung sounds, breath sounds. There were 12 experts, underline please, experts, and two recorded sounds. We had uh, the possibility to divide them, to nominate them as one of them according to these prototypes. It was uh, a mess. The experts couldn't find uh, any agreement. The agreement was very poor, classifying the recorded sounds, okay? Then we try to have uh, less, four prototypes, and we could give the name to any of the recorded sound. Uh, well, it was fair to good, but we said finally, okay, tell me, it is crackle always, and we all had an excellent agreement. It seems that the essence uh, of our clinical point is to confirm if it is a breath sound, crackle or whiz. So in our case, it is quite important to be sure that it is whiz or not whiz. Uh, and we come back to the one stated decades ago in a paper in JAMA, saying again, classifying them as discontinuous and continuous, having these two types of breath sounds and especially continuous considered as wheezing breath sounds. To be honest, in uh, the way the task force tried to classify, to nominate breath sounds, had 
representatives of each language. It was again a mess uh, because from the same country, we have different names from the same sound. So if doctors, these were all doctors, have uh, really difficulty to give a name, uh, to recognize the sounds, we can understand how important it is to get the correct recognition, being as simple as we can with doctors and patients or parents also. The, theme, the take home messages of this short presentation are the following then. 200 years after stethoscope usage, still more difficult to describe than to distinguish breath sounds, as Lenek said. Crackles and whiz really are well recognized. Enough is enough, no more. The usage of terms varies widely, using different terms the same sound. An objective recognition and description would be ideal. We need the objective recognition and description then. The final assessment is a synthetic clinical procedure as we showed, we had seen that WIS can be produced by different clinical entities. That's it, the end of my presentation and uh, my close friend, Blend Karadas is going to present his own presentation. Thank you. How can we improve our understanding of wheezing and uh, how can we overcome the disagreement between the families and the physicians? So we will be talking about the struggle of pediatricians and patient, parents with a wheezing child. So the first question, questions are easy. Are all reported wheezing to really described by parents? Of course, no. And the second question is all for us, for the pediatric pulmonologists and pediatricians. Is all that wheezes, asthma? Again, no. So there are two sides of, two different sides of difficult and different sides of this question. So why is it important to recognize wheezing? Because if we are talking about wheezing, then we should know the benefits of uh, the definition and treatment and prevention of these. So first of all, emergency room, room visits. Now summer is ending and now the season is starting in autumn and winter. Our emergency rooms will be full with wheezy child with bronchiolitis and asthma or uh, wheezy infant, how, however you call. And the second important question is, or diagnosing asthma. Unfortunately, we don't have any gold standard to diagnose asthma. Wheezing is the most important tool for us. And it's, we are in the same position with Hippocrates uh, from the country of uh, Kostas and me, mine as well, maybe. <laughs> and uh, the third one is in order to get appropriate medical treatment, you should diagnose wheezing. Otherwise, you do, you, if you don't, especially in the developing world, if you don't call the disease as asthma, you will not be giving inhaled steroids or leukotriene antagonists uh, to treat and to control asthma. So because of these, detecting wheezing is very important. And another practical aspect is frequently usage of antibiotics in these kids. Most of the kids in the emergency rooms are receiving antibiotics due to some terminology called as bronchitis or I'm not sure whether it is pneumonia or not, that let's give antibiotic. If you cannot call the lung sound as V's, it is a problematic one and most of these kids are receiving antibiotic. And again, another aspect is unnecessary lab, lab tests. Normally, in most of the cases, you don't need any lab. You don't need to draw any blood from the kid or you don't need to get x-ray. But if you cannot call uh, this patient is wheezing, then this is a big problem again. And now the personalized medicine is fashionable. And in the future, I think we will be dealing with these issues much more often. So we should decrease the anxiety levels of children and the parents. So it should be a 
patient focused approach and if you can say it is wheezing then you can assure the patients and parents that their disease is not a severe one so this is a nice study uh, performed in uk and just to show uh, the other side of wheezing if you if how the patients or parents feel at home for example the red ones it's i, I can understand it's difficult to read but the red ones are the fear and anger of the families and uh, the red one the green ones are joy and happy happy uh, memories so when they are at home you can see there is no happy moment because there is uncertainty is it these is there any severe disease shall i take my child to the emergency room or so on uh, but even in the emergency room pediatric board special clinics, you can see that if the diagnosis is not clear if the physician cannot say it is wheezing then this fear and anger is continuing this is an old study uh, 20 years ago one of the first studies showing the disagreement between the physicians and patients or parents because as physicians we always think that we know everything we diagnose even sometimes some physicians i know get angry about the patient oh i'm the doctor i will know this this is totally wrong this is a proof for that you can see here in only 45 percent of the cases parents and doctors were in agreement so more than half parents and doctors think the other way so in 39 percent of the patients you can see here doctors found wheezing but the parents were not calling it as wheezing so especially when you think about the terminology used by physicians in the ERS task force organized by Costas, even the doctors do not know how to label it. But the, from the parental side or patient side, it's terrible. In Turkey, still, I cannot know, I cannot be sure what they are calling. Just I'm trying to mimic, trying, asking them to mimic the sound, but it is not so accurate as you can imagine. And in 14%, you can see here, parents say there is V's, but the doctors say no. So it's problematic. And you, if you can see, look at the right, left hand side where to the responses to the open questions, you can see here, especially in the sound, they call it hissing, squeaking, whistle, rat, what I hear. It's so complicated. This is another old study, but nice because when you look at uh, the severity of the wheezing, we can see here. If the wheezing is easily heard, the agreement is high, near 95% of the patients. If the wheezing is heard easily, also a doctor found it easily. But if there is barely, you can see here, uh, this agreement is going up. And the interesting point is the figure two. When you look at the lung function's peak expiratory flow rates, if you hear the wheezing easily, Peak expiratory flow rate is something around 55%. If it is, there is none, it is above 90%. So if the parents are hearing wheezing at home easily, you can just ask them directly rush into the emergency room because uh, maybe there will be a problem, a risk for hypoxia or so on. So again, in terms of the parental understanding, uh, ethnicity, is important. This is a study again performed in the UK uh, among more than 4,000 patients. If the patients are South Asian, they are under reporting wheezing. If your language is not English, again, you're under reporting it. Again, if the mother is not giving the history, if you are not asking to the mother, again, the response is less accurate than expected. So, in most of the studies, mothers are used. So maybe when you are reading the paper, reading a paper about, about that, you should be looking at whether mothers responded it or the others. So again, socioeconomic condition affects this. Mothers' edu education affects this. If the mother is well educated, they can have more agreement with physicians than the others. If the mother had asthma, if the patient had recurrent wheezing, uh, the agreement increases. So it is an, a benefit for the history taker to ask these and then to evaluate these to be much more accurate about the wheezing. This is another study but showing the other way. Uh, again, the agreement is 
But this time, parents and uh, physician interview wheezing and shortness of breath uh, with parents were twenty percent, but the doctors found it towards six percent. So it's in the other direction. So according to the populations you are studying, it can differ. They can be under-reporting or over-reporting. Of course, the age of the children is important. If the parents are talking about a child at three years of age, the agreement between the physician and the parents are 80%. But if the child is 11 years of age, it goes up to 92%. So if the child is getting elder, then the chance of being agree with the parents are getting higher. So you can see here again, and the risk of asthma also uh, prevalence is going down with the age as expected. The first episode of wheezing is always tricky. Here you can see if the patient has fever, the patient can be reported false. The parents can report false. But if tachyp there is tachypnea accompanying tachypnea, you can trust on the parents much more uh, reliably. Again, it's the same for the wrong chi and so on. But in the end, again, parents know it best. If they report true Vs, true positive Vs, you can see here asthma prevalence is nearly 20%, but if there is false positive, it is 4%. So if there is an agreement between the physician and the parents, you can say that the risk of asthma is much more higher than the normal population. And again, lung functions, will be lower in this correct recall uh, group. It's even lower than the wheezing group. Uh, only if the only doctor hear the wheezing, it is even higher than the both-sided agreed patients. Identifying wheezing is challenging for parents and children may not be able to, of course, we don't uh, expect them to articulate their breathing trouble. And also there is not experienced physicians will be agree with me. There is not only one kind of wheeze. There are different types of wheezing, uh, even you cannot uh, just label them. And all this noisy breathing coming from blocked nose or congestion, or even from a throat infection can be a confusing factor, especially, uh, for example, personally, I'm asking them, make them uh, make their child to cough or just make laugh, uh, then if, the sound disappears, it means that it is not wheezing. So what about physicians? The second part, Costas mentioned about these and all these tables and these frequencies. Is it wheeze or rattle? What are the additional findings? Is it localized? We should be careful about foreign body aspiration. There are so many children diagnosed as asthma, but have foreign body aspiration, especially in the Mediterranean countries. And what about the risk of bronchiectasis? We should be careful about this. So the difficult side for the physicians, there are two parts. One is, is it really wheezing? Is there anything, any other disease, underlying disease uh, with this kid uh, wheezing? So for example, in acute bronchiolitis, this is maybe much more common than asthma. We will be hearing polyphonic wheeze and inspired crackles. And in acute bronchitis, due to the ex excessive secretions, it can be rattle, rattle can be here. Oh, and, and the same doctors can be, call, call, can be calling uh, this, wheezing, this as wheezing. So it's really a difficult task. Uh, maybe we will be needing artificial intelligence, uh, which will be uh, mentioned uh, by Professor Alderan, Van Alderan. Acute viral, viral bronchiolitis is another disease that we are depending on wheezing. It is the much more accurate one, uh, accurate definition factor. If you hear wheezing on auscultation, you can call it as bronchiolitis uh, if you are really thinking about bronchiolitis. Even there are some studies uh, showing is there any way to distinguish different viral infections? For example, at the a uh, column, you are seeing influenza, and B, it's RSV. So you can see here, in, if you hear wheezing, the risk of this child having RSV is higher, but in, in influenza, there is no high risk in, uh, when you look at these studies. Again, how do you call asthma when you ask the doctors? 
again, wheezing is a seven, multiple seven times higher risk for uh, asthma diagnosis. Of course, the, when you see the patient, it is important. If you hear wheezing at rest or nocturnal cough, it differs. For example, wheezing at rest is a much more accurate one as, you, as we expected, but nocturnal cough and dyspnea and wheeze is a little bit tricky. But if you look at different settings, if you are working in a medical school, again, your diagnosing asthma in a right way is much more higher than the general pediatrics practice or a general practitioner. But when you look at the different typings, this is just, um, I will be focusing on the persistent troublesome V's subgroup. This is a latent analysis. So there is a, this subgroup with uh, the yellow one. You can see here, it is a much more troublesome one. Uh, and the, these patients are, have continuous wheezing. And when you look at the age again, when the child is getting older, there is again, the chance to get, to diagnose the patient is getting higher. So uh, in conclusion, um, many cultures do not have a word for wheeze. Nearly half of the parents struggle to identify wheezing sounds. Doctors fear patients will be undertreated due to the unawareness of wheezing. Wait and see approach may cause delayed intervention to prevent attacks. And physicians hesitate, they will miss any underlying diagnosis, mainly pneumonia. So take home message for me, my lecture is, it's important to clarify the sound heard by the parents and even by doctors. We need to standardize it. Artificial intelligence may help us to overcome barriers and we scan seems to be the first step. Maybe we should be following Omron for the next steps. Thank you for your attention. Okay, Bulan, thank you very much for this very nice uh, overview. And I'd like to continue to, uh, by introducing the Wii scan itself. And I'll show it to you. This is the Wii scan. It's 12 centimeter long. And I will show it to you later during my presentation and show you what uh, kind of uh, things you can do with it. What I would like to state very clearly, it is a new tool to help parents to confirm we. So it really is meant for parents and not for doctors. This is uh, already shown by you by Costas, the stethoscope, which was invented about 200 years ago in the Necker Hospital in Paris. And uh, what you can see about it, it's called the old warrior of medicine. And I think lots of you will agree that with me. Where I would like to start is this already somewhat older study from Fernando Martinez. And it's the title of the study is Prognosis of Early Childhood Wheeze. And what many of you know is that he started a birth cohort of about 1,000 children. And after three years, it appears that one third of these children had wheezing during one period or more periods in their life. And he followed that group uh, until their age of 22, but uh, in initially to six years of age. And he found that of these one third of the children that uh, wheezed during their first three years, in 60% of the children, the wheeze disappeared again. And he called it transient wheeze. And in 40% of this uh, group, uh, we persisted and these children were in most cases diagnosed as asthma. Then there was the no wheeze group and they were followed up also six years and a group that never wheezed 77%. And then a smaller group late onset wheeze and that was also a group where in the majority of the cases that were diagnosed as having asthma. This is a very important study, but what you have to know about it, it's very nice, but uh, you can only use these terms in retrospect. It doesn't help you if uh, you are in your office and you see a, a wheezing child in front of you, uh, and it, it doesn't give a clue 
about the future of the wheeze of this child. And this is what we know about wheeze. One in three children wheeze before their third birthday. Cumulative prevalence of wheeze at age six years is 50%. And it's quite an expensive disease. Preschool wheeze uh, utilizes 0.50% of the total healthcare budget from the United Kingdom. We have a rather long differential diagnosis of preschool wheezing. And uh, only a few of these diagnoses uh, occur frequent. Of course, recurrent viral upper uh, airway infections, of course, asthma, post viral wheeze, especially uh, post viral wheeze after respiratory syncytial virus infection, and also wheeze that occurs in preschool children after they have been exposed to cigarette smoke. And then there is a rather long list, even longer than I uh, put up here, long list of rare diseases. So these are the frequent ones. Then we know, and um, Bulland have showed it uh, very elegantly, we may be interpreted differently in the first place because of differences between observers, parents versus healthcare. Uh, providers for, versus doctors. We can be uh, interpreted differently when reported retrospectively versus real time or prospective. And other factors may also play a role, such as in, in the environmental context and the cultural context. What for us is important is the, the agreement between parents and, and healthcare providers. And this was a study that was shown already. And we, this study showed that in 55% there was disagreement between parents and physician, and physician assessment of wheeze in children. And a somewhat uh, later study from 2004 from the group from Lowy that found that lung function in children with physician confirmed wheeze was significantly lower than lung function in children with only parental reported wheeze. And that indicates that maybe if physicians uh, establish the diagnosis of wheeze, confirm wheeze, uh, that means that maybe these children are worse off later in life. Another thing that we use in our daily practice is predictors for asthma. And what we know up to now is that predictors for asthma may give an indication. And we know a few. History is a, a predictor, especially the family history uh, with respect to allergic diseases and asthma. Maybe physical examination, maybe if wheeze is confirmed by the doctor, that may be an, an indicator, maybe a predictor for asthma later in life. The same holds true for non invasive measurements such as exhaled NO, serum markers, uh, specific IgE, certainly in relation to a history of uh, allergic disease is a predictor for asthma and maybe also findings of uh, biopsies. Predictors for asthma may differentiate between groups, but in all these cases that I mentioned, uh, they increase the chance to develop asthma. However, there is overlap between uh, the groups that were investigated. And up to uh, now, uh, there uh, is no diagnostic available for in a daily practice and certainly not for parents. Uh, what I would like to do now is step to the we scan, the new development. And again, I'll try to show it to you again. It's 12 centimeter. Up here, you can see uh, the membrane. There is only one button on it. Uh, it it uh, has a uh, Bluetooth receiver and it has two indicator we indicators wheeze a let life uh, light that could uh, light up and an indicator of no wheeze and um, it detects wheeze for patients of four months to seven year old it consists of this handset with a built-in microphone you can place it under the right collarbone to uh, detect, uh, I don't know if you can see it, this is where uh, approximately my right collarbone is. It detects uh, a wheezing sound, and as I told you, it says wheeze or no wheeze. So it's, it's quite a simple device. 
Overham Healthcare has created this unique center and the algorithm that can detect the presence of weeds. Here you can see the different phases during the development. Breathing sounds were recorded. There is an algorithm that identifies weeds versus other sound and then maybe even more important, a machine learning algorithm that increases uh, accuracy with every new data point. The development phase, lung sounds were detected, pre-processed and put in a three-dimensional uh, parameters uh, spectrogram. There was a feedback loop and the parameters were added and memorized uh, in the algorithm. And then there is the usage phase. Again, of course, it started with the lung sounds, pre-processing, and then there was a calculation, the probability that the sound that was heard was wheeze or uh, no wheeze. Then in the algorithm detects abnormal sound within the red line as wheeze based upon the CORSA guideline and all the other lung sounds uh, were uh, looked at whether they uh, could be used in the wheeze spectrum or not. And the reason that it was done, that this would make it uh, safer to detect uh, wheeze. After this initial phase, uh, a second phase started and that was performed by people of the University of Medicine in Wisconsin. It was validated of, uh, among children suspected to have asthma or bronchitis. There was a comparison done uh, between two group wheezing subjects and no wheezing subjects in three age groups, three months to two years, three years to five years, and six years up to and including 13 years of age. And each group contained 100 children. And this was, of course, a very important step in the validation of this, this, of this device to look at the sensitivity and the specificity. And you can see here the sensitivity is 0.95% uh, and the specificity is 090 which is really nice. These are the people and the hospitals in which this validation phase took place. Great job what these people did. And uh, then I will come to my, uh, to my uh, last uh, slide. In the first place, the Wii scan, which is very easy to handle. Again, here you can see what I told you before. The on-off button, the only button of the device, the indicators for Wii's or no Wii's, and uh, the uh, receiver and, uh, of, of the Bluetooth. What I have to tell you is that it does not replace the stethoscope. Stethoscope so, is a tool for physician, and this uh, Wii scan is a tool meant uh, for parents. And uh, parents uh, shouldn't be bothered with the stethoscope. Then the second thing I have to tell you is that uh, it does not measure severity from the uh, physicians that use this uh, little tool already in their uh, clinic and outpatient clinic. We know that the scan detects wheeze, but even if you have given a number of times a bronchodilator such as uh, salbutamol or albuterol, it's it still, if the uh, wheezing sound is uh, very weak, it's still detects this sound, so you cannot use it to measure uh, the severity, for instance, of an asthma attack. Then the last slide that I will show you, there uh, are apps to support this uh, new tool. You can download them for free in the App Store if you have an iPhone or in the Play Store if you have an Android telephone. It automatically syncs uh, with the WeScan uh, device and the app is compatible with the device uh, uh, parents get. There is a notification function that it can remind you to give uh, the medication uh, the doctor has prescribed. Parents can record major symptoms uh, in the app. And of course, this is all meant to make communication with your doctor easy and, and more clear. Okay, thank you very much. Um, what I would suggest is uh, that we go 
to uh, the discussion. We have a few minutes to to uh, do that. Bulent, if you can unlock your uh, your microphone, I can see that. Maybe we can start off with a few questions, and also the the people that are listening can uh, can uh, give their uh, questions to us. I will go out my sharing point. We have already the two questions. We maybe we can just start with them. Okay. Uh, the first, the two questions are from Yoba Adegoke. Yeah. And I think two of them are for you. Is there a publication on the clinical validation we scan? No, uh, no, that is a, that's a very good question. I think it will come, especially from the group from Wisconsin. There is no uh, publication on the clinical uh, validation of the Wii scan, but I have no doubt that it will appear uh, very soon. The second part is if the Wii scan is meant for parents, how do you mitigate the risk of a false negative result, assuming there is a severe underlying condition? I well, I think that's also a question for for me. I don't think that uh, that uh, you cannot uh, mitigate it because the the Wii scan is a very simple device. It says Wii's or no Wii's, and of course you have to. Uh, if parents report this that their child Wii's, you have to do a follow up uh, in your own office or in your own hospital. That's of course of of uh, great importance. So uh, it, it, is, it is a help in diagnosing, but it, 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 the, your, your responsibility as a doctor remains the same as it uh, was yesterday. Okay. Can, I, can I ask a question? Uh, do you think, uh, because we are in, a, in quite a difficult discussion, parents don't know what wheeze is, uh, maybe doctors know it a little bit better, but should should we teach uh, uh, parents what wheeze is? I, I know there are video uh, programs to teach parents, but do you think that will be of help? Thank you, thank you. Yes, of course. We, we need it because we need to explain uh, what uh, whizzing sound means. Uh, and uh, that's the way we come back to the doctors. Uh, doctors should be uh, aware clearly what whizzing means. Uh, so uh, having this possibility uh, with the device, I come back and I could say that it is very useful because I liked very much. It is not uh, a machine saying uh, we have crackles uh, or any other wrong eye uh, or wheezing. It is just wheezing or not. As the experience says that if we come through by saying, uh, okay, might be uh, a mixture of crackles and uh, that is uh, mycoplasma infection or anything else, we come to a confusion. Uh, from a parent, we need just to know it is wasting or not. Uh, it is a matter of uh, the doctor now uh, to differentiate uh, through the history and the clinical examination uh, if it is uh, the value. Uh, and the point is to start quite early recognizing wheezing. So, especially in asthmatic children, uh, parents mainly know uh, what is wheezing. And it makes it, it easier for you as a doctor that it's most likely wheezing what, what, uh, the, parents, uh, what the parents describe. Yes, of course. Uh, we never forget our uh, medical thoughts and uh, we ask different uh, questions. Also, uh, other questions to organize our thoughts. Uh, but if we have an information uh, that but we have a reason, uh, we come around this thought 
and uh, we could exploit uh, correctly the information. Yeah. Okay, that's that's clear. I, uh, Bulent, I have a question, uh, really in line with with this uh, this question. Is uh, is there any way that we can uh, close the gap between the understanding about WIS between parents and and physicians? I think. Uh, thank you for this question. Also, this WIS can may help also, but. Uh, I think this is only the first steps. We need time, but it's very uh, interesting and exciting uh, and the start of a new era. Uh, in terms of uh, closing this gap, I think being a good physician and uh, this giving right, the right decisions all depends on the time uh, you are spending on your patients. So when you look at all this literature, uh, it seems that if you can get a detailed history from the parents, and if you know the background, how uh, these respondents are behaving, because we should know this, uh, because you cannot uh, think that a mother and father is giving the equal history to you. A mother is always giving much more emotional way. So maybe you should be asking uh, in Turkey, for example, is it your first child? Is, the, is this the only child you have? How old were you when you get this first child? Are you a doctor, for example? All are these important questions. So I think giving enough time and taking a detailed history uh, will help the physicians to close this gap. And also in the future, maybe, I'm thinking about this V-Scan Pro for the, for the doctors. Because Costas, you worked a lot on the uh, terminology but in the end again it's mis messy uh, so it's maybe, disappointing results yeah, yeah. and maybe in in the end maybe uh, we will be needing an objective way uh, of uh, detecting where, what is this at least also for the physician side as well so this will be this will be the finish of this closing the gap uh, project but until, the, until then, uh, we should be getting detailed history. So we, we, so we need to know a little bit more than, uh, than at this moment and still continue to go on with what we always did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Kostas, Kostas, do you think that uh, after this task force, uh, what should ERS do? Is there anything that ERS can do for be something? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, the, the, the essential point is to educate uh, doctors and then doctors will educate uh, their patients, their parents. So if doctors are well educated, uh, having in their mind uh, what wheezing is and what is behind uh, this time. On the other side, when uh, we are able uh, the snore uh, or every other type of uh, noisy breathing, uh, it is so interesting to know correctly and then we could back to clinical practice uh, to uh, assess correctly our patients. But Kostas, uh, shouldn't we uh, try to agree on how we call WIS? You showed, I think you did that, showed the list of all the different countries who have all different names for wheezing. In, in uh, the Netherlands, we have the term people, which is what a, what a, what what uh, mice do. This is the sound mice make. That is people. So it's, I mean, why don't we call it all wheeze or whatever name we want to 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 do it? It makes as a start. It makes it. I'm easy. afraid. I'm afraid it is a waste a waste of time to try to to build a name. Uh, it comes, uh, you know. Uh, from uh, the inner way, uh, and uh, that's the name. Uh, we need to know what does it mean, 
uh, and be aware from different names. You see, uh, in this study, uh, we are very much surprised. The one, the only one noise, which was uh, the same in all the languages, it was stridor. Stridor, stridore, stridor. And, but, but only Greeks had different uh, term sigmos means. All the other languages, 36 languages, uh, has the same one around stridor. So, wheezing uh, was, well, a, a battle, was a disaster. Uh, so many terms. But still, we need to know, since sigmos wheezing, it is the sign. Uh, we need to know correctly the sign and then the name comes later. Okay. Follows. Okay, that is, that is reassuring. We don't have to invent a new name. Um, I think we are coming to the end of our time. And um, uh, what I like uh, to know as a final uh, question to Bulland, what is, what is your, your uh, approach, uh, just the, the, your clinical approach to the first time wheeze in a child, in a, in a, in, in, in a young child? Yeah, this is, this is very tricky uh, because when you see a child, you don't know even this, I'm just talking about the wheezing child. Is this a bronchiolitis? Is this the first time asthma attack? Or is this another lung disease that we will be dealing on pediatric pulmonology? So it is very, very tricky. But how should we behave? The, I think uh, the most important part of uh, this, uh, the answer to this question is, uh, of course, we should be thinking about cat and dogs when we hear any noise from our garden, not the lions and, or tigers or giraffe. But there can be also a lion one day. You don't know. You cannot be sure. So I think, uh, of course, we should be thinking about all the diseases, but we, know, we should behave the first time visitor as they, ha they are having bronchiolitis, maybe, if they don't have any parental uh, history of asthma, and if, if the patient do not have, does not have atopy, just uh, wait and see uh, protocol is uh, appropriate for these kids, but it's very tricky and depends on the patient. And because of this, maybe individualized approach and personalized medicine uh, will take over and uh, we should be listening to the parents much more often. And another important thing for a pediatric pulmonologist or pediatrician is keep the doors open to the parents. They should ask or any question whenever they want and they can reach you whenever they want. Otherwise, uh, it will be very tricky. So the message is just go on with what, what you've always have done and this new device can be uh, maybe of help in the communication, uh, but continue to think and continue to take care. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much.